Hi, everyone. My name is Jules Turpak. Across social media platforms, I cover digital culture, which, you know, encompasses a lot today, including work culture. Like without the digital world, we couldn't hold this event. And without the digital world, work from home would by no means be as much of a norm today. I've worked with Handshake in the past. We've hosted events about tech, education, um, the Federal Reserve. So I'm super excited to be here today. Also, mostly because I know how overwhelming this time in your life can be looking for internships and looking for your first careers, finding the right fit. I was actually someone who like my college major has nothing to do with what I do now. So for anyone who's here, maybe feels like they're a little out of place because maybe their major doesn't align, but they're just curious about the federal government. You're just as welcome and qualified to be here. And I'm, you're, I'm excited because you're going to learn a lot. So with that in mind, I'd like to introduce you to today's panelists. We have three panelists. We have Hannah Bonecutter, who is a public health professional, currently working for the U.S. Department of Veteran Affairs in Washington, D.C. as a presidential management fellow. We have Sanji Ranadeev, who is an IT specialist at the Cybersecurity Division in CISA. And that is not CISA as in the musical artist, that is CISA as in Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, but we love CISA as well. Um, Caitlin Gandhi is the director and co-founder of the U.S. Digital Corps, a two-year federal fellowship program for early career technologists to enter the government service. So I want to start off with quick intros from each of you about your role specifically, since I gave your personal intros. So in one minute, can you explain your job to us like you would to a fifth grader? Let's start with Caitlin. Oh, great. Hi, everyone. Um, I would say when you think about the government, the government is supposed to help people and we're supposed to provide services, things like helping kids and families get access to doctors and food. We as a people, we use our phones and we use websites now to get services, but the government isn't currently set up to allow you to do it that way. And so it makes it a lot harder for people to get the things that they need. So we need to change that. And the way we change that is we bring in people that can do that kind of work for the government. And so my job is to help find those people, bring them into the government and connect them with a job or a project that will help them make a difference for people and help them get their services faster and easier. Awesome. Let's move to CNG. Hi, everyone. So um, I currently work for CISA. And what it is that I do is, um, uh, as Caitlin said, we live in a digital age. Everything is online. And unfortunately, because everything is online, we have a lot of vulnerabilities and security issues that adversaries, um, other countries, other nations, or even just, you know, scammers um, who are trying to uh, get personal information or uh, financial uh, information from you. So part of my job is to work to secure um the cybersecurity supply chain. And uh, primarily how I do this is that I support the activities of the Federal Acquisition Security Council, which is tasked with um, uh, basically figuring out um, what software and solutions that are used in the federal space that can introduce really, really terrible vulnerabilities that can really hurt a lot of people. So Part of my job is to uh, assist that uh, the FASC with uh, figuring out ways to get rid of all of that bad code and um, and uh, protect the federal space as well as um, the citizens of the U.S. So large mission. Thanks for sharing. And Hannah? Yes. So to a fifth grader, right? Think about any type of machine and my job in my current role at the Veterans Affairs, specifically in their Office of Enterprise Integration, keywords, is to make sure all parts of that machine are working as best and efficiently as possible so that the final product can be the best it can be. So in this case, the machine is the entire Veterans Affairs agency, which is 450,000 plus employees serving millions of veterans and their caregivers, families, and survivors. So there's a lot to do. There's a lot to ensure that is integrated cohesively and harmoniously, but that's, that, that's what I do. And so it's a lot of um, strategizing, project management, and much, much more, but making sure that final product being the best healthcare and surround whole health services to the veterans and their families, caregivers, survivors, 
are the best it can be most effective and most efficient. Perfect. Thank you for explaining like a fifth grader. I search everything with like four dummies at the end. So I get like the most basic knowledge for stuff. Um, So I appreciate it. We're going to stick with you, Hannah, as we go into the first conversation about paths into the Fed, because when it comes to college students, a lot of them are initially interested in like fellowship programs, fellows programs. And you obviously have experience with the presidential management fellows program. So can you tell us a bit about that background and how it led into your current role as well? Absolutely. So the PMF, how the PMF describes it, that's it for short, uh, Presidential Management Fellowship, is housed under the Office of Personnel Management for the federal government, OPM. So you'll see the website later, but they describe it as the flagship fellowship across federal government. And uh, it's a two-year fellowship, and its goal is to take who they see to be leaders um, and leaders across America, but they have to be graduates of graduate school, recent grads, to train them to be the next leaders in federal government. So, and you can do that in any agency. So if you if you are accepted as a PMF, you can be at any federal agency. But a lot of times you line up the agency that you may be with according to your graduate degree program. Hence, my graduate degree program is a master of public health. And so me getting into the veterans affairs was very much aligned with that in terms of the VA being the not the uh, largest public healthcare system in America, which was very much of strong interest for me and always in one of my top choices for federal agencies to work with as a PMF. Super yeah. helpful. Um, Sanji, want to move to you and hear a bit about your background. You can start as far back as college if you want, but can you share a bit about the Partnership for Public Service and what led you to it and how it helped you get into your role today? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So um, I found my, uh, I got into government through the Partnerships Cyber Talent Initiative, the CTI program which connects recent college graduates of both undergrad and graduate degrees um, uh, whose degree programs related uh, to cybersecurity. Um, It funnels them into positions throughout the federal government agencies. So not just just one particular agency, but uh, to all agencies who are interested in the program. So um, I... Through that program, I accepted a position at the Department of State, um, who where I worked for two years before moving into my current position at CISA. But um, this was the CTI program was the way that I got into the federal government space, and I actually found it completely by chance, (laughs) senior year of college, um, just like any other fellowship program, you had to apply and go through interview rounds before you were accepted into the program. So um, I did all of that my senior year of college, and um, I was able to interview with a variety of different agencies and and different offices, not just the Department of State, but also the FBI, among others. So um, I eventually did end up accepting the position with the State Department, but um, I really uh, enjoyed my, uh, I really benefited a lot from this program because I got such great exposure into government work, into cybersecurity at such a, uh, so early in my career. So the position I had accepted uh, at the State Department was actually my first full-time job. So right out of college, went into the federal government. Um, and, you know, as evidenced by the fact that I now still work for the government, just at another agency, I really, um, came to appreciate, uh, working in the government a lot. Awesome. Caitlin, as the director and co-founder of the U.S. Digital Corps, you're doing a lot of behind the scene work in terms of getting tech talent into federal government jobs. Can you tell us a bit about that work that you do to help recent grads find a path into government roles? Because obviously right now, you know, tech talent is all the rage with, you know, the rise of AI, as we're talking about right now, increasing cybersecurity threats. So definitely want to hear about your background there. Yeah. I will say um, my background when I graduated from school, from undergrad, I was I was a math major and applied math concentration at the time, a precursor to data science to age myself appropriately. 
but I was trying to work for the federal government. So Sanji, I'm so impressed that you did. <laughs> and you went straight in. I applied to a bunch of things. I did not make it through. The hiring process was really confusing. And I couldn't figure out like, what was the secret sauce to making it all the way through these hiring processes? And how do you find something that you're really interested in? Um, and is a good match for your skills. And I think when Chris and I were trying to found Digital Core, that's what was so important to us in the design of it, which was to hit on a lot of the things that PMF hits on, right? Creating a community and a culture of support for the folks that actually do come inside, but also to figure out how we could make it easier for, or like bring the best of industry, I guess, to the hiring process for the federal government. Again, bring best practices for support and engagement throughout, and then um, just create a stronger experience overall for that first job in government. And so what we end up landing on in our initial design for digital core is what we have today. We're only about two years old. Um, so we are a two-year fellowship, similar to PMF. We are fully paid. We are um, geared toward early career technologists. And so while PMF, you do need to have a graduate degree, for our program, we are looking at folks right out of school to get in as well as those that do have more advanced degrees and all in the technology fields. And so we're hiring in five basic disciplines right now. So product design, cybersecurity, software engineering, and then also data science and AI as sort of a combined track. And we can talk about that in a little bit if that's of interest. Um, and what we're doing is we're very intentionally not only designing the hiring process to ensure that we're doing some skills-driven hiring, not just resume review, but also um, we're actively doing matching for you. I think one of the things that's really hard is you look at um, some of the websites or some of the opportunities and you're just not sure, like, is this the right fit for me? Can I do this work? Does, do they want the skills that I have? But also what is this really like? Like, what are the conditions on the other side? So is this a supportive agency? What does their tech stack really look like in practice? How digitally mature are they? And so we're trying to help by doing a lot of that sourcing of projects and vetting of projects before people actually come on. So part of our hiring process actually matches you and your skill set with these projects that we've sourced for you. And so to date, we've brought on about 90 fellows as part of this, and we're at 19 different agencies across the federal space, and we're actively hiring for our next cohort right now. Love to hear that. And yeah, definitely want to hear you talk about that later. One quick, one more quick question in this section before we move on to the next, well, if one person could answer, maybe if other, if um, the other two have answers, put them in the chat because it'll be really interesting. Um, are there any other avenues into government work that people might not know about? So definitely want to re reveal some secrets, like interesting ways you've seen job seekers land awesome roles within the government um, after graduation. I think the the there's a pathways program um that the that's on USA jobs I believe where a specific uh like uh, specific jobs are uh, portion marked for um uh um for early career recent graduate positions um I myself aren't I'm not too familiar with this program however that is something that I know exists so um, uh, feel free to to do some research into seeing if that program would potentially be a good fit for all of you. Oh, I like that. That's a good reveal. Now we're going to move into the next topic, was, which is why choose a career in the government, especially in a lot of the sectors you guys are in when it comes to tech. There's a lot of tech competition between, yeah, big tech, government roles, and so on. So why would you recommend that today's applicants check out government jobs and being honest about the pros and cons? Because some people might, you know, be very sure that they want to go into the federal government. Other people might be on edge, not really sure what they want to do. And I think it's important we kind of help them make that decision. So pros and cons as well. Anyone can jump in here. I would say, thanks, Caitlin. I would say a pro specifically, and yes, I'm, I'm, I'm helping promote the PMF. Uh, but a huge pro for that is you get extremely unique opportunities that you otherwise will not get uh, as a government employee. In addition to full pay, 
full benefits, all of that. Uh, you get really unique networking opportunities, such as getting to meet with uh, certain SESs. If you don't know what that is, Google it right now. One-on-one, uh, -on -one, pretty much whenever you would like and their schedule permits, nearly as well as you get uh, very great professional development trainings that cost 15000 or more a pop, it's included. You get to do it for free, essentially, and and as well as plenty of other amazing professional development opportunities. And of course, the, the PMF is a huge uh, accelerated pathway in terms of your climbing up the GS scale, which promotions, et cetera. And you get really dope opportunities to work on unique projects within your agency as a PMF. So I, I would say in terms of working for the government, but specifically as a PMF and through some of these pathway programs, because PMF, as um, Sanji mentioned, is a pathway program too. It, it You get really unique perks that, that whether you stay in federal government or not will benefit you, I would say for the long run. Yeah, um, I can also add on to that. Um, so I'm still, I still consider myself a recent college graduate. I graduated May, 2021, which is, you know, a couple of years back, but still. Um, and um, I think when I was job hunting, uh, positions were not as ready, readily available um, as I would have liked it to be. And I think the same case still applies now. Um, there's not, uh, companies are tightening their belts. There are not a lot of positions in these really, cool private sector companies and um and you're also competing with not only your fellow um uh graduates but also people who may have been laid off so it's just a very competitive uh job market and i think one of the major uh advantages that i see working in the government is that um once you kind of navigate it yourself in you're kind you you know where you're going like you can stay uh if you choose to stay in the government you can get promoted fairly quickly when i was hired um i was i started off at a gs7 but now i'm a gs11 and uh, you know provided um i perform you know satisfactorily i have potential promotion potential opportunities to GS-12 within the next year. Um, so I really appreciate that promotion potential, um, as well as the incredible amount of professional developing and development and networking opportunities, as Hannah mentioned. Um, that's very prevalent, I think, throughout the government space, regardless of where you work, regardless of your job, everybody um, is always willing to kind of help you throughout your career. Um, you will be able to receive all of the different types of training that you want to do, uh, training relevant to your job. And if there's anything else you'd like to kind of position yourself up for, you can also do that as well. I uh, Just to summarize, I think the stability and the, um, the, the learning opportunities that you'll have in the government, especially early in your career as a new college graduate is something that um, you can is is something that the federal government will definitely offer you. And in addition to that, you also get job stability, like you won't be laid off, or you won't be, you know, like, uh, you know, you get hired for six months, and they're like, Nope, out the door, you know, so I really appreciate that um, stability a lot. And I think com compiled with all of the other factors that we've mentioned, um, working in the government is definitely a pretty viable option. Um, and quite frankly, um, I think we need more people, um, uh, especially the, the, the recent graduates, like younger people to get into the government and kind of push forward some of these like changes that we want to see. Yeah, I'll add a couple things. And I want to pull out some things that Sanji said that are really important to be like a savvy government job seeker, I guess. Like one thing, your experience on being quickly promoted, right? You can actually look for those. In, um, that can happen anyway, but you can also look intentionally for jobs that name that they are on a career ladder. So Digital Core has a career ladder in place where we 
almost automatically promote you, assuming you meet all conditions and you're performing well from a nine to an 11, and then you graduate the program at a 12. There are other career ladders for other roles. They are published on USA Jobs when you see the posting. So look for that. Um, you should also look carefully at remote versus location preferences, right? When you're looking for something like that. You may also want to look at the hiring authority. Um, we talked about recent graduates. That's one way to provide advantages to recent graduates over other applicants by looking at those roles. You can also look for other hiring authorities like the direct hire authority. Some roles are hired that way. Um, it can provide different advantages in the hiring process. Um, finally, I would suggest that you, um, there was one that came up that I was just thinking about and now I've lost my train of thought. Oh. Uh, creating a career in the federal government. I think it is absolutely true. If you look closely at the job application, you'll be able to see if it is a term position or a career position. And that really matters. So look at that when you're applying. If it's a career position, that is your role for, for life until you step out of it or move to another role. Term positions have term limits. And many of them will be a four-year term with the option to extend for a full eight years or two and two. But just look at that. It's another way to think about building your career. But there is a different implication to how you might build that career inside government if you're choosing a job with a term. So you want to look at that when you're, you're thinking about it. And to this question around, like, what is exciting and interesting, I would just add, um, no one talked about the mission yet. I think it's really unique. Government is very broad. There are so many different mission areas. This is a place where if you want to do UX design and you have an interest in health, there is a job that will have that intersection for you. If you're interested in the environment and climate issues, you can do UX design there too. So there's so many different intersections of your interest. And I think that's something that I've always valued personally, at least in my career and keeps me going when other things are hard. Perfect. Thank you so much. That's so much good insight from all of you. Um, we're going to kind of speed up the next section because we're a little bit behind and want to hit all these different topics. But um, Handshake has provided us with a bunch of really interesting stats. I love good stat. But for business, computer science, and civics and government majors, those account for obviously a large percent of the applicants in the federal government. Um, but there seems to be a place for everyone. Like we, there's just a lot of different roles within the federal government that people don't necessarily know about. So I want to get into some of those potential areas for listeners today. Um, recent Handshake data shows that job postings from federal employers on Handshake have increased by 22% over the past year. That's a huge jump. Sanji, have you seen increased opportunities by early, for early talent, talent in your area of the federal government? Definitely interested to hear that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, like 100%. Um, and I think the major driver of this is that the current presidential administration has a lot of kind of ambition in increasing hiring in key areas like technology, cybersecurity, and with the new AI directive that was published, AI. So there's so many, there's a lot of catch up that the government has to do in terms of developing these frameworks in cyber AI, just to name a few. But um, that that since that requires such um uh that requires a great a greater amount of key people um it's just not feasible to only populate those jobs with folks that already know what they're you know already have uh ex great careers in ai or cyber in the private sector or what have you so um a uh looking towards recent college graduates that have degrees in these areas or not even uh, degrees, but maybe like interest in the in these areas, I think is a great way to bridge that gap between the, the need that's there and then the, the folks that are able to fulfill that need. When I was looking for jobs, I loved when like the skills that they wanted were really painted out. So Hannah, what are some in-demand skills that you've noticed for someone at the VA or even more broadly in the Presidential Management Fellowship? Yeah, definitely. Thanks for asking that. Uh, definitely tech savvy. And AI, the government, from from my experience thus far, is, is learning AI stuff. And AI is still forming, still getting its policies. So that's still new. So when I say tech, I'm not just jumping to AI. I know that's a very hot topic right now, um, but I'm talking about Word documents, Excel, know how to do 
a, a bunch of different blast emails at one time, listservs, that type of thing. And that may seem basic, but it's a really integral skill and, and it's going to be used a lot in federal government. Uh, DEIA background and knowledge and potential uh, experience in that that is definitely uh, very sought after as in you will see many federal governments VA included as of as again Sanji mentioned um current administration that's one of uh, racial equity and whatnot is is a priority of the Biden administration right now and so many different federal agencies are standing up either new or relatively new DEIA offices, departments, et cetera. Definitely presentation and public speaking skills. Uh, absolutely always can be beneficial, especially when briefing uh, higher ups on any topic or, or just a fellow employees. And I would also say particularly in a lot of the health agencies, federal agencies, but even just in general, uh, especially I would say the pandemic really highlighted the importance of public health and put it on the map like like no no other. And with public health, there's social determinants of health, and these are creating all the different outcomes that many of these federal agencies are aiming to serve among our public or fix if they're if they're deleterious to people. So. And knowledge and background on that is really key because public health is being now sprinkled and embedded into many of the different offices and departments uh, missions. Thank you so much for painting the picture of what you mean by tech savvy, because there's it's such a wide range today, especially with all the digital divides. Before we move on to myth busting, which I think is really interesting, Caitlin, if you could answer just a similar question really quick in terms of you're kind of focused a lot on AI right now. So what does tech savvy in terms of skills or just other general skills within that um, specific hiring process look like to you? Yeah, I think the other folks are right in that we're emerging into AI as a government. And so in addition to definitely wanting people that have the beginnings of that skill set, but it is an emerging field, right? Like I can't say that anyone is an expert in that field right now, but we all have something to offer. Um, we are looking closely at other AI enabling skill sets, right? And other tech work that surrounds and enables us to be ready for that space. And so whether that is like uh, thinking about like data scraping or data management, things like that, uh, how do we figure out like what the problem space is, frankly, and scope the problem space to even consider if a solution and potentially an AI enabled solution is right for that. So we are really still in need of product managers and designers to think through those kinds of problems. We are in need of software engineers to help us actually build some things on the ground. Like the digital maturity of government, government is so broad, it varies greatly, but we all need to level up. And so there's a lot of room for collective growth in each of these dimensions. And so really all of these skill sets are deeply needed. I did want to add to what Hannah was saying. I think that it is really important to bring not just a particular tech or other skill set, but there are some things that are generally going to make you really successful. You mentioned communication skills. I would add um, the ability to build coalitions and move others forward in the work. Part of government, you might be one of the only technical people on this project. You're going to be working with someone that is focused on policy, maybe someone that is in the HR space, someone who has a legal background, someone who is leading a program or a project, and you're going to need to bring them all together and align them and what you're doing to be successful. And so people that can demonstrate that skill or learn in that area are incredibly valuable to have and really are able to reach the impact that we're kind of hoping for in the work that we're doing. Awesome. Thank you. Um, this next question, we're going to get into a bunch of myth busting, which, like I said earlier, is very interesting. I'm going to leave this open-ended for any of you to answer, but probably just one person in um, to respect time. There is obviously a misconception of, you know, you, you think of the federal government, automatically you think of D.C. It's not really a misconception. It makes a lot of sense. But in terms of opportunities within other parts of the country or also across the world, definitely want to hear to what magnitude those opportunities are. I can jump on this one if this helps. Um, ironically, I'm in Washington, D.C., so don't take that as a sign. <laughs> but I happen to be here first before my job. Um, about 70% of U.S. Digital Corps fellows are not in D.C. or spread across the whole country. Um, we also have a fellow for the first time in Puerto Rico. We have someone in Hawaii. So the opportunities exist to be remote and work for federal government. 
Um, I would also add, we have a couple of fellows, they work at the State Department, so it's not the norm, but they are going on a lot of international trips to go to our embassies and other places where people work in order to make sure that they are cyber secure. We have to protect our diplomats where they are and ensure safety. They do a lot of other really cool things. So even if you are in DC, there is opportunity to travel and um, be more active in that space. There's just a lot of flexibility now. Amazing. Hannah, did you want to add to that quick? Yeah, thank you. I was just going to, Caitlin's absolutely right. And again, with the pandemic, uh, I think all pathway programs, fellowships, internships, et cetera, with the federal government had to adapt just like the private sector, just like anything else. So there are ample fully remote positions from anywhere uh, in the in the world and specifically certainly within the U.S. There's, of course, certain security limitations with federal government, but uh, definitely the U.S., and particularly with the PMF, uh, you have to do a, ro a rotation, which can be, it's basically like six to four, four to six months of your time in your two-year fellowship, you're working with a different agency. And in that, a lot of times there can be opportunity to travel to another place, whether it's another state or international. And in fact, I'm about to do my rotation with the CDC, which was another one of my top agencies with public health. And I'm going to do it with their Eastern Europe and Central Asia regional office. And so I'll be living in the country of Georgia, specifically Tbilisi, Georgia, and traveling all around that region starting in January next year. So there's there's a lot of opportunity for, for travel uh, and, and other living situations. That's so cool. You'll have to keep us updated. Like, so interested <laughs> in that. Um, for all of you as well, want to keep this question op open-ended. What's the big, biggest misconception you feel there is about government government work and how would you or how have you responded to it? I can start off. Um, I've heard that government work is boring, <laughs> which cannot be like the opposite of the truth. Like um, that. Yeah, like um, I work in cybersecurity and this is a field that is well known for being dynamic so things happen at such a fast pace. Um, there, there's like new laws, regulations coming down from the executive branch. There may be things happening in the private sector that we have to keep an eye on. Um, there's uh, activities that are happening outside of our country that we have to keep an eye on. There's, it's just a very dynamic field. So, and even if you're not working in cybersecurity, if you're working in the government, uh, the government's job is to serve, you know, the uh, America. And we, we are in a extremely interesting, I think, time of change. So regardless of your position, you will be touching something that is constantly dynamic, constantly um, make keeping you on your toes, as well as uh, providing you with uh, with numerous opportunities to uh, to see different points of view and different tackle different problems, different challenges. So I I I will put my you know I will put my um, my foot forward government work is not boring. It is extremely challenging. Um, and it will definitely keep keep you engaged, whether you want it to or not. <laughs> yeah, I mean, just to reiterate that point for all the panelists here, when it comes to tech, it's like, right, uh, what, two weeks ago, the AI executive order came out um, just last year that, you know, the blueprint blueprint for an AI Bill of Rights, there hasn't been like social media legislation for 20 years. And now it's like, there's all these talks about it now with recent, so like the tech space within the government is going pretty crazy right now and definitely needs a lot of help. So does anyone else want to add to that about misconceptions in the government? Uh, I guess add one that I hear a lot is pay. I know it matters deeply, especially when you're entering your first job. Um, I would say do your research and look at the places that you are interested in applying for. Digital core, there are a lot of pay incentives across the federal space if you know where to look for them. Um, Digital core, for example, has a recruitment incentive. And like I mentioned, we hire also on a career ladder. So we're moving you up pretty quickly promotion wise. So what that equates to is like in the DC area in your first year, it's about 86,000. In your second year, it's a little over a hundred grand total compensation. So it's never going to be the equivalent of some of the, the industry offers that you're going to get, but there is a certainly livable uh, uh, income here that is feasible. And then coupled with a lot of the other benefits that we talked about, it can be a pretty attractive package. 
Okay. Super helpful. Last thing for myth busting, we're going to have a lightning round. I would love to kind of get it done in three to four minutes. So we have five minutes for everyone else's questions. True or false, government work is slow. Sanji answered that. She would say false. Was would do you both agree with that? I would say I, I disagree. I think for the most part, it is slow. Um, for the most part, there are some times when it's not. And 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 perhaps Sanji was more so referring to maybe the day-to-day, because on a day-to-day, I think I heard her say you do have a lot. Like it is fast paced. You're in meetings, you're doing things. The day to day can as actually pretty fast, but in terms of I think what a lot of the public perception of in relation to that in terms of government, oh, what are they doing? Why isn't this happening? Why are these things still going on in society? That can appear slow, and that process is slow. Federal government is traditionally set up to be incremental, so while policy can get passed, it probably took maybe anywhere from two to ten years to get it passed and created. And then it can take anywhere from one to five years to get it fully implemented. And then and then we're talking about then on after that or during evidence collection and to see the results. So that part is slow and you have to have uh, grit and dedication and faith to remain in it. <laughs> I can add, we launched the digital core four months after I joined GSA. So we can move fast. But sometimes there's a reason why we move slow because the things that you're creating affect real humans and they're really hard to unwind. And so you don't want to make missteps. And so I think sometimes slow can get a bad rap. Sometimes slow is is bad. There are cases when slow is actually thoughtful and safer mm-hmm. and better. And so being able to parse out the difference matters. Yeah, that's a good point. And you not to put words in your mouth. I'm sure you probably agree with that. Yeah. Like the day-to-day is fast, but yeah, in terms of the processes or they can be slow. Last true or false is, is the application process for government jobs. Does it take forever? Cause I know Sanji, I believe you spoke to that earlier or maybe someone did about how the just application hiring process seemed so overwhelming. Um, is it so? Um, I can start off with this. I think it can be slow. Um, but it's also contingent on a lot of other factors. Like, for example, if the position that you're applying for requires security clearance and the level of your security clearance, that can take forever because <laughs> you have to, um, There, there's a whole process that needs to be followed and due diligence is definitely required. But um, I can say for my current position, um, I was, I think, like interviewed earlier early like in March this year and then I got the offer in May so the conditional offer I had to go through clearance later but like that was an incredibly quick turnover Um, and that's because of all of these hiring initiatives uh, being pushed out so that people are being hired faster Um, so to those who are interested in uh, a government position I would just say go ahead and apply, even if you're not sure how long it might take. There's no harm in putting your application through the door and seeing what happens. Awesome. Thank you. I'm sure that clears a lot up for people. We have five more minutes here, and I think we have some time for the audience's questions, which I'm really excited about. Um, I think we ha- we're we going to pick like four, try to go through them fast, um, even though a lot of people send in questions, and thank you for sending those in. Okay. So when... It comes to whether it's cybersecurity or otherwise, do you have to obtain a security clearance in advance before applying to a job at the federal government? So I can tackle that really quickly. Um, So since my position requires security clearance, um, I can say that you you when you apply to a position that requires clearance and you don't currently have clearance, the understanding is that after you apply and get the conditional offer, they would then put you through the security clearance process. So you don't necessarily have to have any type of clearance. Um, however, sometimes having a specific type of clearance could make the that process go faster, um, but there's no requirement to having it if, you, if there's a specific position you're interested in, but you don't currently have clearance. So apply, and then um, you'll, you'll be given more information about how that process will go. Thanks, Sanji. Okay, next question coming from, I'll ask it anonymously. 
I'm a veteran with years of work experience and currently in my senior year of college. What would be the best approach for a federal job as a veteran? Is there someone I should talk to? So a veteran, uh, your U.S. veteran, yes, the PMF is veteran preferenced. So it, which in that application process is quite long, but you, if you're a veteran, you get, they have to by law, look at preference you veterans are preference in the candidacy pool so definitely keep that in mind thank you yeah, so much just to add um that is true for most hiring authorities so there are some exceptions but anything that's pathways related will include veterans preference um anything that's regular competitive hiring will also include veterans preference as part of it so there are a lot of advantages. There are also specific programs for getting veterans into government too that you might want to look into. I can't name any off the top of my head, but and I don't know, you may be very well positioned to name some of those from your seat at the VA. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, I'm I I'm drawing a blank currently, but if I find some, I'll definitely uh get, get that information out. Yes. <laughs> Maybe we each like have you just go around really quick in terms of are there any specific certifications that someone can attain? beforehand to stand out specifically where you guys are working. So um, if any come to mind, maybe just blurt those out. Um, so for cybersecurity, I think having Security Plus, the CompTIA Security Plus is a great entry level cert that you can att uh, attest to. But um, I think one of the really cool things about the federal government is that you don't necessarily have to have a specific certification. If you can prove on your resume that you have uh, you have experience equivalent to a certification, like for example, um, you've done like networking uh, at you've, uh, you know, at like your dentist office uh, where you were a technician, um, that is uh, still as um, uh, important. Um, as getting a certification. So uh, don't discount the current experience that you do have. Try to uh, try to format your resume in a way to where your experience, uh, uh, where it's clear how your experience um, aligns to the position you're applying to. Perfect. Um, any Anyone else want to say some last minute things on that question? I might, yeah, I might just, I mean, any certification I think can be really useful. And I say that specifically because in the application process, I noticed on USA Jobs, which is where the vast majority of federal government applications are, they do, most of them had a slot for certification and you could even upload your certification. It didn't say any type. It could, so it could be anything. So even if that's a CPR one, you never know. Um, that I would say definitely put it forward. And I know I did for my uh, education background. I'm a licensed educator, so I would always upload that certificate. And I was asked about that in some interviews. So it, it can be very advantageous. Perfect. And Caitlin? Yeah, can I add, I think um, it's helpful to parse out that there's two stages of the hiring process for the federal government. So the first stage is qualification. And that's big. Are you minimally qualified for this job? And every job description, every job posting is required to say exactly what it means to be minimally qualified. So if there is a required certification, it has to be listed. If there are certain types of experience that you need, it has to be listed there. And then as the job seeker, you want to make sure, like Sanji was saying, your resume shows how you meet those minimum qualifications. And often it's for a full year's worth of experience. So it doesn't have to be one full year but it can be um, four months at this internship where I did, I practiced this particular thing and six more months here where I did this other thing and more, and they add up to 12 months, right? So there's like this minimum qualification piece. Then there is like, after you become minimally qualified, how do you compete against everyone else? And that's where there's more discretion around like, what is the background that you're bringing? Do you have these kinds of certifications that might matter in this space? And that's, so there's like a difference in the question and a layer to the question that's important to name. Super helpful. Thank you to all the panelists for answering all those questions. I try to fit in as many as possible. And for the listeners, I hope um, this was helpful for you. And maybe if we didn't hit on your question specifically, something adjacent, ideally. So again, 
Thank you all for joining us and everyone, please join me in thanking the speakers. You know, I'll do my little claps here. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. Um, and for all the listeners, if you have a moment, please take 30 seconds to fill out our feedback survey, which is in the chat. I believe Handshake sent that out in the chat uh, very recently. Um, so we continue can continue to bring you more awesome events like this. They're super helpful. We've gotten a lot of great feedback and also follow Handshake at join Handshake across platforms. Um, specifically Instagram is probably best for even more event announcements because a lot are going to be coming up um, specifically in the new year because we know we're going into the holidays and final season. So best of luck to all the listeners on those. And that is it for today. So thank you so much. And I hope everyone has an amazing weekend. Thank you.